Hello again, my name is Daniel Schoonmaker. I'm the Executive Director of Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's presentation of the Michigan's, Michigan's Sustainable Business Forum webinar series. For those that are not familiar with the organization, the forum is a collaboration of business, business institutions dedicating to promote, uh, promoting practices that advance climate leadership, social justice, and the creation of a circular economy. We host events and programs throughout the state, including this month, monthly Michigan Sustainable Business Forum webinar series which is a spot, uh, presented by Shoe Pan Recycling. And on that note, I, I'd like to highlight our next in-person event. We'll be hosting a tour of Shoe Pan's Bottle Bill Recycling Facility in Wixom at 1 p.m. on Thursday, December 1. Attendance is free with registration, and you'll find the registration li link by, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the chat at the right, uh, right today. Uh, also, please do consider becoming a member of the forum. If you are already a corporate institutional member of one of our regional programs, a professional MISPF membership is complimentary. If not, you become a professional member today for only $50. Uh, now I'd like to begin our program for today. Cultural attractions, sustainable business, how museums can lead on how museums and attractions can lead on sustainability. For our attendees, please note that you can share thoughts and questions with the panelists. Or, uh, or all attendees to the chat, the chat function. We will, have time, we will have time at the end, the end of the presentation for open questions and answers. Our featured speakers today are Joyce Lee, President and Chair of Indigo JLD Green plus Health, and, uh, uh, plus Health, and Chair of the American Alliance of Museums, Environment and Climate Network. She was joined by Leslie Tom, Chief Sustainability Officer of the Charles, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in uh, Detroit, Michigan and Almond Forrester, Director of Facility and Sustainability at John Ball Zoo in Grand Rapids. Our first speaker is Joyce. Joyce Lee is a leader in sustainability and institutional, or, in institutional organization with a focus on cultural facilities. She developed policy expertise as chief architect at the New York City Office of Management Budget under Mayor Bloomberg working with, with PLA NYC. Her work on health and sustainability continues in her practice today. Her past reporter includes the U.S. Green Building Council, International Well Building Institute, Queens Botanical Gardens, Whitney Museum of American Art, Museum of the American Revolution, and the Tech Museum. Joyce, thank you for, thank you for joining us today. Um, please please please, uh, please share your screen and and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your talk. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for having us today, and it is exciting to talk about cultural attractions and how the cultural sector could lead. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would just start with the first slide, giving you um, a variety of cultural institutions um, because our practice is national and we work with um, museums that are old and new. Some are old and new in urban areas and sometimes in rural areas. The only thing right now they have in common is that they do not have an energy star score. And that started our work a while back. Let me... Right now, it does not seem to want to advance. There we go. Uh, our work looking into uh, these different museums, which you'll also hear from our other speakers today, that um, many of them can be put into categories in the sector divided by art museum, history museums, and science museum, uh, depicted in these colors. We also look at the sizes of museums around the country from less than 100K, 100 to 400K, and the larger ones, um, larger than 400,000 square feet, such as the Detroit Institute of Art. I'm gonna start with a presentation talking about energy and metrics in museum and end with ESG and how they pertain to museums. When we look at museums, we thought, well, because of very strict temperature and humidity control, we thought all the art museums with their EUI, which many of the in the audience would know as energy use intensity uh, with the measure of KBTU per square feet, art museum would always be at the top because of um, their 24 seven nature of the building. But what we find is that museum EUIs range from less than 50 to 350. And with the seven fold in differences, we know two things for sure. One is there's a lot of waste going on. And number two, 
there are a lot of room for improvement. You see that um, art museum can also be very efficient down at the bottom and interlaced with history and science museum. To size matter, you can look at the small round circle in red where there's small museums. They also could be very inefficient at the top and quite efficient at the bottom, less than 50 EOI. We also take a look at the data divided by climate zones, which the DOE and the US Energy, uh, US EPA use. And looking at the cities around the country, we are looking at three particular climate zones in which most of Michigan is in the cold climate zones. What surprised us is that the ranges are in all three climate zones, even in the marine, more mild climate in the Pacific Northwest. And then a few years later, after we established the first studies, we look at another 20 cities and regions around the country. What does it show us? It only reinforces what we saw in this very wide range. Maybe a reason is that museums are not paying as much attention to businesses in the country in ringing in their energy efficiency. And in some cases, the outliers becomes more than 400 EUI, which is quite alarming. So back in the local city, it also laterally reinforced this data because Philadelphia has a benchmarking law which requires building of a certain size to report on their energy use. So I will share with you that a lot of the class A office building cluster around market streets are in smaller blue circles. So the size of the circle is relative to that UI use. I will share with you a few larger ones, such as the Franklin Institute, which is a science museum, Barnes Foundation, and art museum. And all the way over here, the large uh, orange circle that is the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Many of you might have seen the movie Rocky, where he was running up the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So here it is. Great news is that the city partner with the museum, you can see the mayor on the right, uh, announcing an $11 million performance contract. Many of you might be familiar with the scope of the performance contract on the right-hand side, and this one even include water con conservation. What is interesting is that along the way, we learned that with the many lights in the gallery, moving that all to LED, of course, represents savings, but more importantly to the museum, it is a great protection of their artwork because heat and artwork and collections, they are not friends. So now we go around the country encouraging every single gallery to change their light immediately to LED if they have not done so. Uh, not only that uh, this Museum of Art had done the performance contracting, Science Museum of Minnesota had not only looked at the energy for a little while, which you can see the numbers on the lower left, they also look at carbon reduction. And working with their utilities, they're able to bring down an average of 1,500 metric tons of carbon per year. And at the American Alliance of Museum Environment Climate Network, we also did a calculation of, based on 35,000 museums in the country. And pre-pandemic, we were able to estimate that it is about 12 million metric tons of carbon per sector that this, um, actually in this, which is not a small number, and it's only operational carbon, equivalent to about 2.6 million cars on the road. Um, at the AAM Environment Climate Network, uh, was able to also chair the Sustainability Excellence Award. Leslie Tom here had also been a past winner, but I'm not going to mention uh, that museum. She's going to tell you a lot more about it. I'm just going to highlight a few winners that you can see uh, what they have been doing in leading the, the charge. Uh, this is University of Illinois in Urbana. The museum is a small one on campus, but they want to be part of the president's climate commitment, taking the campus to carbon neutral by 2050. So what they did was tapping into the um, evolving loan fund of the campus and change out not only all their lights, but their HVAC system upgrade. Uh, for a small museum, there's 1,700 light bulbs in the ceiling, uh, including some of those at the uh, display cabinets and also others that are in the work area and office area. This particular upgrade 
led to $750,000 of energy savings over 10 years, not small on a campus uh, in Illinois. Because they document the process very well, we think that is very replicable, particularly for academic museums to work closely with their sustainability office. The next one is a new building in the Pacific Northwest. The National Nordic Museum uh, was constructing a new museum and the Seattle's um, basic requirement was lead silver because the architects and engineers were able to devise a scheme that only put their 20% of their class A gallery into this tight temperature and humidity control. As a result, they are able to make their museum targeting only 62 EUI. If you remember, we talk about some of our museums in the country uh, having 300, over 300 EUI uh, per year. This is an enormous achievement. And you can see how they let the other exhibit areas, the offices and the general uh, circulation area to be less stringent in terms of energy needs. They also use heat pumps and as well as having electrical preparedness for PV uh, in the future. So uh, again, this one uh, is a leading example in Seattle that new construction can look towards. The third one is showcasing how museums can have a real impact in the community. Some of you might have heard of the Phipps Conservatory that has elite platinum buildings and well platinum buildings on campus. This is uh, a conservatory that had gone 100% green power a few years ago. But what they're doing for this application is something quite impactful. They are getting green power onto their campus, enticing the visitors to switch to 100% green power right there and then on campus. And by making the switch, they get a, a year of free membership at the FIPS. And this translates to over 5,000 households in the city of Pittsburgh uh, moving on to 100% green power. And let me take a look at the numbers. The FIPS says that it represents over 50,000 metric tons of carbon emissions reduction during this period. At the Environment Climate Network, we also recently spearheaded a design and construction toolkit for a sustainable exhibition. I want to highlight that both the John Ball Zoo and the Wright Museum have been early adopters. So we really encourage you to go onto the website to take a look. Uh, exhibitions change quite often and it has a lot of the design construction uh, ramifications of a green building, even at a smaller scale. So what do we look at? Uh, circular economy, waste reduction, and for example, on the painting side, are we always using low VOCs or no VOCs? We encourage you to go onto the website to look at the different categories that could enhance exhibition. And lastly, let's go to ESG. Many of you might be familiar with these three buckets of um, environmental, social, and governance. We think that ESG governance, museum actually does quite a good job of because of good board governance over the years. Um, social museums also are starting, taking it very seriously of some of, because of some of the decolonization effort. What museums may be a little weaker in is understanding energy consumption, pollution control, tackling climate change, and waste management, as we have discussed. So our firm has started talking to museums investment committees, asking all the right questions. What work is being integrated? Because endowments generate investment return that could also generate revenue for the museum. Is the values of investing integrated into the funds that the museum is looking into? And how is that affecting operations? Um, how is that uh, uh, reflecting on the ESG values? particularly some of the trustees of museums coming from business are now familiar with ESG. Leading the conversation at the board meeting, at the leadership meeting is really quite critical now. And of course, how is that including the diversity and inclusion goals that the museum is moving the dial on? We have developed a cheat sheet for those who are interested in talking to investment uh, committees of museum as well as the leadership. My email address is here. And we hope that you also are tuned into our Twitter uh, and look at some of the latest that uh, we are putting out um, for both the network as well as the green practices. With that, Dan, I'm going to turn over to my Michigan colleagues. Thank you so much, Joyce. 
Uh, now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Leslie Tom. Leslie is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. She came to this position by way of Wayne State University's Detroit Revitalization Fellowship in 2015. Leslie led both the Wright Museum and Michigan Science Center to be awarded the 2019 American Alliance of Museums Sustainability Excellence Award. She co-chairs the Knowledge Committee for the American Alliance of Museums Environment and Climate Professional Network and was the past co-chair for the Venues and Museums Detroit 2030 District. Leslie, I'm really, really looking forward to, he to, uh, to hearing and seeing your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Let me share my screen and we can start. <laughs> Let's see. Present. Oh no, it's not working. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, hi everyone. I'm like Dan said. I'm Leslie, the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Wright Museum down in Detroit. I'm just going to be going over a little bit of background about our museum, our beliefs and frameworks, an example project, and then what what's next. So act one, we are located in Detroit, Michigan in the cultural district. Um, Neil Barclay is our president and CEO. Uh, he's an amazing leader. He came from, he was the originally founding director for the August Wilson Center in uh, Pittsburgh, which is also a lead building. And so he really values and is able to support all of this work so well. Um, my background is in architectural, I'm an architectural designer, as well as an information management uh, degree. Um, so I love data, I love user experience, and um, being able to plan and think and implement. So uh, Charles H. Wright, who our museum is named after, was a OBGYN doctor in Detroit. He delivered over 7,000 babies. And so um, we're interpreting his writings um, and his intentions to be building a legacy um, for the sacred connection between African American history, culture, our environment, multi generations, and our community. So, when I first came in 2015, my directive was to just reduce our utility bills. Um, and in doing that, uh, we installed variable fan drives. Um, we reduced our energy bill by about $35,000, but it was all very invisible. And, um, and it sort of seemed like a missed opportunity to not tie in being a public institution. And so the purpose of this talk is to sort of talk about how museums, zoos, cultural institutions can be collaborative partners. Um, so we expanded our portfolio to be about green experiences for the next generation, um, a lot of design and planning work. So the problem that we sort of rally around is that we all live in a wasteful, unjust oil-based society, and we all in our e work in different silos. And so um, we're proposing how to take down some of those silos through our different um, industries. So our vision um, and one example project is that we designed some green stormwater infrastructure back in 2017. Um, we did more than just a transactional approach. We were able to add art uh, by ho holding listening sessions, over seven of them um, involve artists, involve um, children, helping to make decisions on how we can interpret this green stormwater infrastructure and rainwater on our, on our campus. And so the end result was um, a 70 foot um, per permeable pavers project um, where it's, a, it's the image of a Sankofa, which is a West African Adinkra symbol that represents a bird that is able to look backwards and forwards, um, meaning that we need to look back to history before we move forward. Um, we worked with the elders where the head of it um, faces the, the front entrance. But in this work, we were able to make connections and uh, collaborate with the city of Detroit and work with the Nature Conservancy on their um, project of creating a GIS system that documents all the green stormwater infrastructure in Detroit. Um, we were able to save from our drainage fee at the museum. Um, and we were able to also, from those listening sessions, come up with guiding principles as we continued all this sustainability work. Um, so we created this thing called the Green Museum Town Hall, where about 120 people came and shared their thoughts and opinions. And now we are collectively all moving forward to, to make sure that this is our foundation. Um, 
Also because of this green town hall, uh, Neil and our board of directors created uh, sustainability as one of the main five pillars for the museum. So now it's publicly and unapologetically embraced environmental sustainable systems and practices in all aspects of the rights institutional programs and culture. So what this means is that our programs department, our learning and engagement department is starting to uh, weave in some of the sustainability programming, water programming into our museum. Um, and this also meant that we were able to create a whole master plan where we um, are spelling out more opportunities to be able to green our institution. So our beliefs is that we need to address this, this climate crisis collaboratively. Um, and we're, we are definitely doing that. We came up with this framework where we want to expand the triple bottom line to be people, planet, programs, and prosperity. Um, and instead of just one department and one person holding all of this work, it's now spread across multiple executive leadership um, departments where we all can help to hold what sustainability means throughout our institution. And then what this means for our entire institution is that each of, I am sort of a sustainability integrator and I work with all the different departments, um, working with executive leadership um, and uh, various groups to be able to understand our vision and focus and then be able to um, bring that in and weave that throughout the whole museum. So museums are one of the most trusted um, places to get information. There's the, as Joyce discussed, um, the American Alliance of Museums um, did some research back in 2008 and found that museums are most trustworthy. Um, so an example project that I wanna go into for the next five minutes is our um, D tree project that we did. We found three dead and dying trees back in 2018. And instead of mulching them or tearing them down, we decided to collaborate with our neighbors across the street, the College for Creative Studies. Um, and we created a whole wood workshop. So this is a project, a special project where we are acknowledging that, that objects are not neutral, that the trees in front of our museum um, are special, don't wanna be turned into things like just a cutting board, that these trees have uh, told a story and have seen a lot of things in Detroit. Um, so we met with large groups of people to be able to understand our um, intentions. And we were able to use service design projects and action research to be able to sort of rethink about what this experience is for the studio. And so what the museum did well was create a curriculum, create a treeposium, which is a tree symposium, um, interpret, narrate, narrate uh, how a curriculum for the students. And then the College for Creative Studies had a wood workshop and the logistics to be able to hold this, to hold uh, the students and give scholarships. So um, we were able to work with 40 artists across Detroit to help uh, create this project. And I'm just gonna show this really quick little video at dtree.me, which is our website um, here. So, so you can get a taste of um, when we combine art with, uh, with artists and makers. There is something magical <clears throat> about the trees of Detroit. <laughs> These trees have much to teach us about respecting the wisdom of people, of place, of history. The relationship between people and trees has often been difficult here. From deforestation centuries ago to bankruptcy field neglect more recently. So you can listen more if you go to <laughs> dtree.me. Um, let's see if I can get back into my presentation. Oh no, sorry. Uh, but this, this, um, this class has been incredible at having so many different outcomes that were not planned for. So I'm gonna go through some of that as well. Um, we recruited students from Highland Park, Hamtramck and Dearborn through um, giving out seed packets to tell people about the class. Uh, this is our triposium, and we had other lectures, but we basically had Detroiters, landscape architects, um, artists, makers, elders to talk about their experiences with trees. 
we, co we collaborated with Design Corps Month of Design and over 900 people came to this event um, online during COVID. Um, and here's some images of our wood, wood workshop studio. Um, we held an exhibition in where the old Charles H. Wright Museum was at CCS. And um, as a result of having this exhibition, um, there's news articles and um, we, we even had a, a chance where both of our institutions were able to have lunch. I feel like museums are really good at just planning parties and coordinating and choreographing different people coming in and out for exhibition openings and closings. And so it becomes this really amazing opportunity to help shape um, being able to listen and give chance for people to learn about the environment. So the next steps that we want to do is we're going, because we had this exhibit at the, at the college um, and our curator went over and saw this exhibit, we're now moving this exhibit over to the Wright Museum, July through December of 2023. Um, this will be one of the most low carbon <laughs> traveling exhibits because we will be walking everything over. Um, but I invite you all to watch our website at theright.org to find out more and to follow our journey. Um, and this is just uh, being part of a lot of different groups like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. It sounds sounds like the right has a lot of wonderful things going on. I'm going to have to check out the uh, uh, check out the check out the new exhibit the next uh, next time in Detroit in a few weeks. Oh yes, do. Now I'd like to welcome to his, to 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 the cream Almond for uh, Forrester. Alvin has been with the zoo since two thousand since the year two thousand and hosts degrees in both horticulture and landscape architecture. He's over thirty years experience in almost every every arena of site management, including facilities, constructions, ground, housekeeping, sustainability, and planning. He currently oversees the facility department, building and grounds department, a security and owner representative for capital projects at the zoo, and currently is the, is the sitting past president of the National Aquarium and Zoo, zoo, zoo Facilities Association. Alvin, please, uh, please take it away. Hey, thanks, Dan, and uh, really appreciate some of the, the two uh, uh, presenters before me. Uh, a lot of inspirational work being done at a high level in different areas, and uh, and I'm a, I'm a tree guy. So, Leslie, I, I, I missed that tree thing. It's kind of cool to be to be part of that. I, I love trees. Um, so, a little bit about the, the, the zoo here, a little bit. Um, just want to talk. Um, uh, we're not a museum, but yet we're still a cultural attraction. Um, we see a lot of folks that come through, through our area. Uh, I like to say we have living uh, exhibits, you know, uh, all, all throughout our, 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 our facility. Um, we have uh, uh, typical zoo animals, um, but conservation is really at the core of what we do. And we, we've been around for, for a long time. Uh, we're actually the 11th oldest zoo in the country. Um, so we have a, a, a long history uh, of things that we do there. And uh, uh, education, of course, is important to us. Uh, but conservation is really at the core of what we do. We would love to be out of business someday and not have to have any animals in captivity. However, uh, reality is, is that uh, their, uh, their areas are in decline. The loss of wild places is our biggest challenge to uh, reintroduce animals back into, uh, uh, back, back into the, their, their normal, normal ranges. Um, so, so what we do on the sustainability front really goes to help support you know, some, of those, some of those ideas and some of those concepts. So kind of, and let's spend a little bit of time on, on this slide here and kind of go into some of the details uh, uh, um, of what we kind of done. It's, it's um, uh, uh, again, kind of, kind of uh, a little, little bit of my background is, is I just didn't embrace sustainability at the very get-go. I was about saving dollars, um, say, you know, and, and saving resources part of saving dollars. And our biggest part that we started doing uh, uh, about 20 years ago is to, is to start really working on a water area. Our water was the highest utility at our institution. Again, being an old facility, um, back when water didn't matter as much, a lot of things were done you know, probably not quite the right way. Things were plumb bright, leaks weren't really being taken care of. Um, uh, reduction was at the forefront, you know, and we were using about 83 million gallons of water a year in 2002. 
So we've been going on a, on a big journey and, and quickly started reducing that. Now in the last about seven, eight years, we've been averaging low 20 million gallons a year. So that's about 75% reduction in water. Again, that was first off about, hey, how can we save dollars? Yeah, uh, and it really is a big deal. Today, if we use the same amount of water, it'd be about 450,000 extra dollars to our operating budget that now we don't have to, uh, to worry about, you know. But it slowly started working into all other things that we can do in the in the uh, you know environmental uh, area about uh, about us. Again, it's it, you know we're a campus. We're about the um, we're our whole site's 103 acres, but the zoo sits in about 38 acres of that. Uh, you know, and again, we get well over half million visitors a year. That's during the summertime. Uh, a lot of voices. And also, I want to kind of go into some of the voices, not only of zoos, but also uh, you heard some things about the museums and how people trust. And, and attend us. Um, so AZA Zoo, so Association of Zoos and Aquariums is the highest level of accreditation you can get for or zoo or aquarium. And we're proud to be part of that. Only 10% of all uh, USDA licensed facilities to exhibit animals have the highest level of accreditation. But that's a very important voice. Of that group, there's uh, 238 uh, institutions. The attendance of those um, uh, exceed the professional football, baseball, basketball, and hockey attendance per year. And that's pre, pre COVID numbers. So it's a big voice that we have. So what we do, how we tell our story is very impactful to help to uh, uh, help frame up our folks. We, we believe that unless you're able to, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, engage the heart, you can't inform the mind. So through our animals, we're engaging, engaging the heart, uh, again, we're trying to be able to tell folks about some important things. So one thing that we're, we're you know, we're kind of proud of is that uh, um, uh, is our waste diversion for at our site. So this includes a, a 103 acre park, 38 acres is the zoo inside there. And this is all of our animal waste bedding, all of our uh, um, uh, uh, recyclable material, and all of our just general trash. Um, we're 80% diverted from landfill incinerators. So that's a pretty that's a pretty good number, especially with a, with a lot of things that we can't control, you know, because it's what the public drops into us and give us. That's really successful uh, because locally we have some, uh, um, our both city, county, and local region has uh, facilities that will take the material for us that makes us successful in those areas um, uh, for that. And again, Kent County is, is, is a co-mingling recycling facility that is, that, is, that is super and allows us to have some of those, those high impacts on that. Our whole site um, uh, is, is heavily treated. Um, our city has a 40% uh, uh, can, uh, canopy goal um, by like 2040, I believe. Um, uh, and our site's about 80% canopy already. So we, we far exceed that, but we still like to have um, as much of, uh, I mean, if you're looking down from, uh, you know, from Google Earth, you know, can you see our buildings? We have we have six buildings that have full or partial uh, uh, live roofs on it. Um, and we got another one uh, planned for here in the uh, spring of uh, 2023. 20, uh, so again, to kind of help some of those, uh, um, uh, uh, some some of the heat heat loading that happens, and we all know some of the natural benefits of uh, of some of those green roof areas. And, and to me, the biggest benefit is when people can see them, what that evokes in them. Because again, we want to evoke that that sense of nature in them, uh, so they can really make some changes in their own own daily life. Um, just as uh, that, that way I mentioned, uh, uh, well, let's do that tree thing is kind of cool. We do a lot of our own stuff with trees. If we have to uh, harvest a tree for a new animal habitat or we have some trees that fall in our, our park, we bring in a portable sawmill in, you know, it's just uh, like you guys brought in to make uh, uh, your artwork. Well, we use it to do construction material. And we've literally uh, used uh, thousands of board feet from stuff that is falling on our site and reuse them throughout the uh, th throughout the facility. Also, again, being an old facility for tearing down things, we try to reuse as much old rock, whatever we can do to use uh, on our canine. It's only, it's only good environmentally, but it's also good for to save some some dollars, you know, here and there as we, we go along. Geothermal hasn't been has been something we've been using for quite quite a long time, and we'll continue to use that. Uh, we currently we have a pygmy hippo habitat under construction. Uh, 10,000 square foot facility, 35,000 gallons of water uh, for in, for indoor, outdoor, underwater viewing, um, and that whole entire facility is uh, is being taken care of uh, with geothermal, but no CO2 emissions. So that that that's pretty cool, and 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 we'll continue to harvest the uh, 
uh, we're, we're in the Midwest, especially in Michigan, we're in that sweet spot where our heat loading and our cooling uh, uh, requirements kind of balance so that as we're using geothermal, it's very, yeah, very cost effective long term on that. Uh, plastic is something that we've been uh, that impacts our, our, our critters that are in the oceans dramatically. Um, as plastics break down uh, in the water, they, they kind of uh, mimic plankton in a lot of ways. And again, plankton is one of those uh, early uh, uh, critters that start that food chain. And the consumption of that is just having dramatic effects on our, uh, on our uh, 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 friends that are in the oceans and streams and waterways. Um, and that's something that we've been we've been uh, targeting really hard. And, and a few years ago, we, we stopped selling any anything with single use plastic for any of our beverage containers. It made a big impact um, environmentally. And right now, we have a, a Was to Shore um, traveling habit uh, exhibit that goes around uh, different uh, different places. That's all made of different artwork uh, from the uh, uh, waste that's been thrown out and cast out and ends up in our ends, ends up in our oceans. Um, Again, water is something that started out being something very important. So water is something that connects us all. And and uh, and in a, in being in the Great uh, Lakes water uh, uh, shed, uh, it's very, very important. We keep uh, our water as clean as we can in our area. Um, so nice water reduction, but something we, we uh, had just completed in 2019 is that uh, we can handle um, for our the zoo, a micro footprint of 30 acres, we can handle a 100 year rain event on our site. Um, by being able to collect all of our uh, all of our stormwater, goes through a nutrient sediment baffle box, gets cleaned up, goes into a pond out front, further clean being cleaned up, and we're working right now to uh, try to reuse that water back into flush toilets with with gray water, uh, and to use it for animal habitats. We're still working through code issues because it's uh, if you get into the southwest, they have a lot of lot of easy ways to reuse water. Stormwater, but here in the Midwest where it's so available and uh, uh, the code at the state level is not quite let us do that. So we're trying to break rules um, to, to make that happen. But again, to be able to handle a 100 year rain event on our site and, and, our, and our site is inside the city of Grand Rapids, um, which for those of you who are outside of Michigan is the largest city outside of the Detroit metro area. So it's a it's a it's a pretty cool thing. The next few slides I'm gonna go through is uh, is looking at some of our green building, what we're doing. So LEED has been around for a long, long time, 25 plus years. There was one time, uh, I think in, uh, in early on in the, in the LEED movement where Grand Rapids had more LEED buildings per capita than anywhere else in the US. Um, so West Michigan has, has always embraced uh, green building uh, to, to a large extent, but LEED doesn't fit well with animal habitats. Um, uh, you can see one here on the screen, that's a typical animal habitat, so that's meerkats, and it doesn't, you know, lead doesn't really fit very well. So what we started looking at is other things that we could do to kind of help broaden the base and kind of start to uh, help leading in some different areas of what's what's the next thing for, for building. I know in our, our region of, of, uh, of the country that to build a building to code nowadays, it meets um, lead standards. So LEED has done a great, awesome job in help, uh, improving the green building uh, movement to now it's basically, it's just being done because of code. Now, how can we move that move, move that uh, 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 higher up and get more, more, more of a, a unique way to, to look at stuff? Um, Amir had a habitat uh, opened up 19, um, and we went after a, 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 a sustainable sites initiative. Um, that was a... Um, uh, a, a uh, it's kind of a daughter program of LEED, still through GBCI, is the one who ranks it. It's a point-based system still, but it really, it's really looking at uh, outdoor environments, parks, nature settings, that kind of stuff. And, uh, um, you know, and, and on that uh, uh, project, um, we have a, a, the green roof on there is all native plantings. Matter of fact, all the plants in that whole landscape there were all, were all native. Some are so native that uh, they're, they're uh, we have uh, some local folks that uh, Plaster Creek stewards that uh, 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 harvested some seed, they grow seed and sell plants. Well, we actually got some, uh, a lot of plants in that habitat that were actually locally harvested. And now it's in there, it's pretty, can't get much more farm to table um, than that, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so the native plantings, and again, with with uh, sites, they, they, they really, again, water something that uh, 
they, uh, they, they, they frown upon using excess of water. We don't, we don't use any irrigation at all. If we have to hand water a few plants because we're under stress, we do that. Otherwise, uh, again, being native, they can kind of handle it and we're, we're having to be uh, um, uh, uh, working through that one there. Um, pretty cool. First uh, Zuna Road the certification is pretty awesome. Um, and something cool that we're proud of here in Michigan. Um, uh, and it also does a zero to emissions as well. So um, it worked out cool. And again, our little friend here on the screen, he just loves this uh, little new habitat. You know, it's good for him too, because uh, our customers are not only the, the guests that walk through the door, but the uh, folks that take care of the animals, but the animals themselves. The next thing that we're, we're doing with our whole front entry project. And this is something that if you're not aware of Living Building Challenge, um, I encourage all of you to kind of uh, uh, spend some time in this space to learn about uh, learn about this. This is this is going to be the next thing that's the, the next lead, as you can say, for the for the future. Folks right now are saying it can't be done, just like they said, you know, lead could not be done. Um, but it's really having some really high standards um, that you have to do. It's a pedal certification. We're doing it for a our pygmy hippo habitat, as well as our whole front entry of the zoo that we've kind of redesigned and started working on back in 2020. Um, again, there's some real high end things you have to do, you know, reduce your water usage by 50%, your energy use by 70%, huge waste aversion you got to do, and the and and the red list. Red list is materials that that uh, they they have on it that you can't use with these different uh, compounds or or, or chemicals or in different products. Again, we all know that some of the uh, unhealthy uh, uh, living spaces that some of our disadvantaged uh, folks in our community live in are from areas of high industrial, high factory that creates those uh, unhealthy zones that, that people are living in. Well, they're trying to make sure that those, those zones don't happen all the way from the beginning of it to the installation and the, and the end of it as well. So living below the challenge, we're going after that uh, on that uh, um, so um, um, we're hope to be complete with that sometime next year. And this is a performance-based uh, green building uh, 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 process. It's not just you get the points, you say what you're going to do. You actually got to say and show what you do have done. And then you got to have it live for a whole year at the monitor to make sure you're meeting all the goals that you're trying to do. Um, and that's what it's not just energy and water, right? It's also your goals on how you're trying to affect people's lives uh, positively. Um, through that. So that's, that's something pretty cool for us. So, and that's kind of the end of my, end of my gig. And hopefully we'll have some baby pygmy hippos here in a few years. So can't get much cooler and cuter than that. So. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to seeing the, 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 the pygmy hippos there, Alvin. The, uh, so if, uh, if you're attending today and have, a, and have, have any questions, please, uh, uh, feel free to put those in the chats or to use the Q&A Q &A tool available on your, uh, uh, likely in the bottom middle of your screen, depending on how your uh, your uh, uh, app is configured. Uh, I have a couple quick questions for our uh, for, for our speakers, though. Uh, and the first one, I, I like, uh, uh, Joyce, the example you used for Philadelphia, and then Alman, you talked a little about kind of things that happened in City of Grand Rapids, and, uh, and, and Leslie, you, you shared some of the things like the 2030 district, and uh, some of the efforts as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping you could talk just a little bit about kind of the the the, the role that uh, attractions as uh, uh, kind of anchor institutions play in advancing their community their 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 communities and host municipalities uh, sustainability initiatives and goals. Leslie, maybe you could yeah, start. Yeah, sure. That's that. a that's a great question. Um, I. I just feel like when we've started to work on some of this work, um, more, more, just it's sort of like uh, more people just keep getting more and more attracted to what what's going on. And so we've hosted, for example, like the you, um, the Urban Director Sustainability Forum um, dinner one time, yeah. um, and it helped us make a zero waste uh, event. So um, it's it's like. Our little community just helps to support um, green people, green institutions, green spaces that are trying to do the right, like walk the walk. Um, it's such a, it's such a lovely sustainability is like such a lovely space because everyone's just so supportive, and we're all trying to do uh, support each other to like 
learn to how to reduce our waste or our energy and um, tips and tricks and just keep doing the real work. So um, to have a community like you've talked about um, and the, all the institutions and all the organizations. Yeah, this is really exciting stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. I would just add that because a lot of times these cultural institutions are mission driven as you have heard from Leslie and Alman. It is really in a great position to lead now that we are seeing a lot of businesses coming around this and who knows the SEC may actually mandate reporting. So coming together, this, we don't have a better time than now to assimilate all of those goals so the impact could be that much greater because no matter how good a business is doing on these ends, they put it out in any reports. But cultural attractions and museums can do it every day and they have staff in exhibition and education to amplify that. And that is what is so exciting about this field. Yeah, to add on to that, it's almost like, like how Alman discusses with the zoo, it's our, our entire landscape, our entire building can help to tell this message and story about how to live in the live with the world with climate change. Um, with their climate crisis and the responses we're doing. And um, I know we're personally, the Wright Museum is starting to work on a pilot project for solar panels next year. And it's just like imagining, you know, how we can start to message that a little bit to, you know, there's like 60,000 children that come through. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. A couple of things I'll add for our community here in Grand Rapids, Dan, is that um, so the, the waste stream thing is a sort, S-O-R-T, uh, 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 methodology that is used both at the city and county, and we've adopted the same thing from signage inside of our, our waste receptacles. So we're trying to get that universal look. So when people are looking at things, they know what they're looking at to kind of help uh, 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 spur it on and kind of uh, have more, you know, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a commonality that we're doing with all that. Um, also, what we do is to help support the, the city's uh, 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 canopy uh, issues that this year we gave away over a thousand trees uh, to folks to plant. And, uh, as, and, uh, and some were shrubs, but most of them were, you know, small trees, trees. And, and it was also not just for the canopy thing, but it's also for our pollinator friends, okay, for the songbirds. Those important things that, you know, your urban areas are being uh, refuges now for a lot of, a lot of more uh, uh, birds and insects and people realize because uh, some of the high pesticide use is being used in outside you know, uh, areas. So, so we're just helping with that refuge area and uh, kind of helping to green up those, those different zones. And, uh, and also we're trying to help at some point here, how can we get in some of the disadvantaged communities and do some plantings around their houses as well? Because uh, that only just does affect the, you know, for the pond area, you know, critters, but also it helps that if there's, uh, uh, landscapes around their houses, then there's less lead paint that's in the soil that kids are playing with ingesting, right? So how can we keep people out of those areas uh, with some plants as well as help the uh, uh, our friends, the insects and, and birds as well? And nationally, I would just say that cities like New York and Vancouver, the cultural institutions are beginning to take a lead in these kinds of discussion uh, with businesses. And I remember in West Michigan, when Art Price first started, the uh, amount of walkable tours right downtown is really a great way to talk about low carbon um, transportation options. And the fact that the Grand Rapid Art Museum, where I used to serve um, as director, the, there is a bus stop right in the uh, entrance of the museum. So all of those could be highlighted um, in cultural attractions in understanding our transportation footprint. Yeah, and I just want to add on to that too. I think there's like really interesting collaborations that are happening at institutional levels. Like, for example, the, the as you're talking about the trees, Detroit just, um, the mayor just, Mayor Duggan just signed um, an initiative for being able to plant 75,000 trees in Detroit. And the US forest, American forest group is helping um, with that, with the, and tr forest equitable tool, a tree equitable tool. And um, we're, we're starting to just have these conversations of like, 
they never thought about um, creating this tool in a museum exhibition sort of space. And once they create this tool, maybe it can go over to the John Ball Zoo. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, so, so um, it almost is like what Joyce is saying, like the efforts that happen when during these collaborative kinds of projects around these cultural institutions can really get become amplified and, um, and, and that's what's really exciting is the that kind of like the Venn diagram of just education, people, planet, prosperity, and really kind of hold as that's the glue that holds all of these conversations and work together um, with these with these cultural histories and artists is just really really exciting work. We, uh, we, we we have a question from Eric Daly today. Um, uh, some of this has been touched on already, as you know. It's and I might expand this a little bit, uh, but he, uh, we're wondering what are some things that uh, patrons and visitors can do to support museums and similar attractives to advance their sustainability work. Almond, you want to take a stab? <laughs> mm, sure, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I, I I think one thing to do is, ju is just keep coming to us. You know, um, um, again, is is uh, sometimes I think that the hammer approach is not the right approach sometimes, and and number one reason people come to 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 zoos and, and probably a lot of us also the museums is to spend time with family and friends. So if we can get them to come, keep coming in to, to spend time, see things that we are doing, they're going to start. You know, let's go start changing behavior. You know, if we keep having signage up talks about you know what why we care and how 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 it's important for them. You know, and again, uh, something that that uh, we're trying to do more and more of is talk about stormwater at our facility because stormwater is so important uh, to keep the Great Lakes, uh, you know, clean. So I think just keep coming to us, and and again, is how we can also what we're what we're trying to do is how can we keep our messages simple sometimes versus getting them too complicated. Um, to again try to hit that target audience for us is the you know the the, the key folks that can really remember and maintain things for enough, you know, to the five to eight year olds is is a, is a key audience for us. I'd add on to Almond's um, comment too that like, yeah, get, get a membership at any of our institutions and kind of vote with your feet and support. And I also know if you, I'm sure Almond has a development grant writing department, but if you reach out to any of them and you wanna have dedicated funds to some of our projects, I know we are working on a D tree studio number two to launch in 2024, 25. Um, and so, all of these, I feel so fortunate to be at these cultural institutions where they are like, Leslie, how much money will it take to do some of these projects? But we're all sort of being self-funded and with the whole COVID thing and not as many visitors, I would really encourage everyone to um, support their local cultural institutions. And in our practice, we notice how many school children visit a zoo and museums. That is a huge audience base where they are brought up to understand the sustainability um, significance of the world that they are going to be inhabiting. So if museums can reinforce that message or even listen to what they have to say, I think that is a very big part, asking the right question. Patrons can also become board members and trustees one day. We know that with this huge transfer of wealth to the next generation, they are going to be asking about where their money is going. And if there are ESG metrics that they can understand just as they are putting their investment in for-profit institutions. Well, thank you, Joyce, Leslie, and Almond. Uh, this is gonna be our program for today, for today everyone. And uh, if you're not aware, I believe the zoo this week has their, uh, uh, their John Ball Zoo, uh, I don't wanna misread it, the Spooktacular. Zoo goes boo. So. Zoo goes boo. Yeah. So so please so please check that out if you're the Greater Grand Rapids area, and please check out the uh, the D Tree exhibit if you are in uh, in in uh, uh, in Southeast Michigan or traveling at tra at tra at tra at traveling at traveling through town. Yeah, um, that's not July 2023, so you all can plan ahead. <laughs> please plan ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry, should have wrote should have wrote that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please, please plan ahead for July 2023. Maybe, maybe our organization will organize an, out, an outing over there. Oh, uh, yeah. 
And uh, and again, thank you, and thank you, Almond Joyce, Lee, uh, Joy, uh, Joy, uh, Joyce, and Joyce and Leslie for for, for your thoughts and uh, uh, great presentations today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, all everyone, for joining us.